Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the Blue Deck Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Mazrak. This has been a very busy week for me. My wife and I are painting a house. Yeah, in July in Florida, we're painting a house that is not fun, not a good idea, but the house is turning out pretty good, so we're happy about that. Also, I've been editing Into the Attic of the World, getting it ready for publication. That's going well. I think that's about it. Oh yeah, one more thing before we head into our recap. Just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's rated the show. That's awesome. I always love reading reviews. And if you take the time to rate us, I might give you a shout out or even send you a deck of blue deck playing cards. That way you can get your rummy on or a canasta or spades. 1500 anybody? Come on, tell me you play card games. Now, here's my daughter Layla with a recap of Chapter 10. Charles and his friends follow Captain Kidd up the launch tower. As they climb the stairs, the captain explains that the Nautilus shuttle was built in the 1930s by a wizard named Dr. Alcatan. A wizard! To board the shuttle, Charles walks out on a narrow platform and steps into the notches on the open shuttle door. The whole time, the Nautilus sways back and forth. One mistake means certain death. When Charles finally dives inside, he looks up to see the sunlight streaming through the cockpit windows and five seats, all with important instruments built around the chairs. And we're supposed to fly this thing, he thinks. William, Don, and Ozzy climb aboard, and when Captain Kidd comes in after them, he digs through his backpack, taking out a small glass box. He secures a box to a bracket on the wall, and when his hands move away... Charles sees it's actually a miniature aquarium, and inside is Joseph, the captain's pet crab. Chapter 11, Preparations When the lights flickered on, the young captain put us to work, prepping the shuttle for liftoff. Ozzie and Don were assigned the harrowing task of removing the vines strung about the ship's wings and rockets. William was charged with cleaning the windows and plugging all the drain spouts around the huge black funnel-shaped rocket boosters. While my friends dispersed, I assisted Captain Kidd with data collection. We, mostly the captain, determined barometric pressure and wind speed using a stopwatch, an enormous protractor with a sight glass built into it, and a helium balloon on a string. When that was finished, we set off to find the upwards-facing door. Near the top of the launch tower, where the catwalk stretched out to the shuttle cockpit door, there was a ladder. The ladder continued the upper climb another twenty feet through the framework of steel I-beams, ending at a small platform surrounded by railing. The white post I'd first spotted from atop the concrete rim was affixed to the platform. That little platform felt a long way up, especially with us already so high in the air. I followed Captain Kit up the ladder, coming out on a floor made of slotted metal decking. Slotted, so I could see straight through, all the way to the ground. I could imagine dropping my house keys and watching them fall in slow motion, smack the deck, then slip between the cracks. Goodbye keys, because I'd never find them after that. Captain Kidd had recovered a collapsible brass telescope out of the shuttle. Now he used it to peer at the sky. I looked up, shading my eyes with my hands. What are you? Quiet, 
he said. I need to concentrate. Then from below, I heard tinkling glass. William was coming up the ladder, his right hand securing three Coke bottles to his chest. He took an upward step, adjusted his grip, then shot his left hand up to catch the next rung. Where'd you get the Cokes? I asked. They got a machine in the break room. He was red-faced and out of breath, his words coming in herky-jerky puffs. For the astronauts, or scientists, or whatever. Or for us, I smiled, reaching down to help. When he was with me on the deck, he wiped sweat from his brow and eyed the captain. Is he looking for the door? Yeah, shh, he needs to concentrate. William shrugged, then we popped off the bottle caps using a squared-off corner of the railing. William tossed his cap over the side. It tumbled through the air, clinking against his support beam several flights below, and disappeared out of sight. I turned mine in my fingers. It was jagged toothy around the edges and bent in the middle where I'd pried it from the lip of the bottle. I stuck it in my pocket and took a drink that was fresh out of the ice box, cold and deliciously sweet with carbonated, sparkly afterbite. Mmm, thanks, I said. He clicked the next of our bottles together. Don bought them. She must have ten dollars in change in her backpack. Returning our attention to Captain Kidd, we watched him walk little circles the spyglass pressed to his eye, and his tongue peeking up between his lips. The search took a long time. Occasionally he'd lower the telescope, roll his neck, wipe his forehead, then go back to scanning. Eventually his circular pacing stopped. He lifted a finger into the air and said the word we were waiting to hear. There. You found it? William asked. Captain Kidd offered him the telescope. William set his coke on the deck and traded the third unopened bottle for the spyglass. The captain took the soda, smirked, and popped the top of the back side of the blade on his bone-handled knife. A few moments later, with a small amount of direction from our leader, William spotted the door. Whoa, he breathed. What's it look like? I asked. William handed me the scope, an amused look on his face. I lifted the narrow barrel to my eye. The view was not at all clear. Beyond a thin horizontal line of hash marks on the lens, presumably those were for taking measurements, all I saw were clouds and blue sky dancing around with the slightest input from my fingers. I braced my elbows against my chest and leaned back trying to hold steady. Captain Kidd stood beside me. He adjusted my shoulders and guided my aim. Then... Flying across the narrow focus of the telescope sped a dark blur. Breathe, the captain said. I let out my breath, filling my lungs with new air, and let it out again slowly. I tried to relax, but the fact that William hadn't needed such counsel was not helping me concentrate on the problem. As air passed in and out of my lungs, I tried to clear my head. At last, the elusive door came into the viewfinder but my eyes refused to focus. Even twisting the eyepiece didn't help. I gave up and handed the scope back. Did you see it? the captain asked. I couldn't get it to focus. The admonition stung. I wanted to see it clearly, but wanting wasn't enough. William drew meaningless circles with his hands. Looks like a cross between a blimp and a space station. A blimp station! He grinned and sucked down the last of his cola. Huh. I muttered, looking up, but if I couldn't see the flying doorway with a telescope, certainly I wouldn't spot it with my naked eyes. Of course, I saw nothing, just flying clouds and their long journeys. With the door located and armed with his measurements, the captain was ready to begin his calculations. We followed him back down the ladder and over the catwalk into the ship. The boarding went somewhat better than before, but still the topsy-turvy sway of the shuttle unnerved me. In fact, my nerves were almost entirely shot. Even though it was only three o'clock in the afternoon, I was exhausted. The stress of the day, along with the march into the forest, the heat, and now all this climbing. After that, all I wanted to do was fall onto a couch and watch television. When we boarded the Nautilus, Captain Kidd got right to work, poring over volumes of ship manuals, all handwritten, and charts of mathematical tables and formulas. I, however, was content to recline in one of the five upward-facing cockpit seats. 
Resting there, I hardly thought of anything. Even when William, Don, and Ozzie climbed up beside me, their commotion scarcely registered in my thoughts. When my mind settled briefly on any subject, it was either a faint curiosity about the incomprehensible control panels in front of me, or my family beyond the wild woods. What would they think in another few hours when I still wasn't home? And what terrible thoughts would haunt them when evening set? And what after that? There I was, my parents' oldest son, my little brother's big bro, sitting in a spaceship, getting ready to blast off to destinations unknown. And I hadn't even left a note. None of us had. Our actions were as mysterious and foreign as the shuttle's controls. And then another thought. The night before in my bed, I had prayed for this to happen. I wanted to help Captain Kidd find his missing patch fairy. But why? Now it was coming true, and I wanted to take it all back. Overhead, on an illuminated gauge the size of a classroom wall clock, a needle started to move. That was the first sign of life I'd seen from the abandoned, sunken spaceship since the lights first came on. I leaned over in my chair and peeked below to check the captain's progress. He was sitting cross-legged on the bulkhead, books open all around him. He bent over, scribbled on the notepad, erased, and then scribbled again. "'How's it going?' I asked. "'This is harder than I remember, but I've almost got it.' He stuck the pencil in his teeth and flipped through a manual. I couldn't tell if he was leading us from experience or making it up as he went. This conflict in my impression of him was similar to my understanding of his age, how sometimes he seemed younger than me, but also so much older.' He stood, gathering his books and papers, then handed them up to me. Charles, put these in that cubby. Then all of you get down here. You're all in the wrong seats. I stowed the captain's library in the bin at my feet and followed my friends down the ladder to stand in the cramped space beneath. Captain Kidd straightened his hat and vest, then stood at attention, addressing us for the first time as our real captain. Charles, your first mate. That means when I'm not around, you're in charge. Can you handle that? I had not anticipated having a title, which insinuated I would also have responsibilities and that the captain trusted me. I can, I agreed. He glanced around at my friends. When you address Charles by rank, you can call him first mate, but chief is shorter and generally accepted. His eyes settled on Don. Miss McFarlane, how are you with electricity? Her eyes widened. I, uh, I know it hurts if it shocks you. Captain Kidd smiled approvingly. All right, then. You'll be our electrotechnical officer. Congratulations. He regarded William next. Who's stronger, you or Ozzy? I am, they both shouted. The captain looked to me. Chief, you know them better than me. Which one's strongest? A test, I was sure. Not of them, but of me. I consider my friends. William was my best friend. He was athletic, and he was bigger than Ozzy. But if I were honest, I would have to say Ozzy was a little tougher, if only because he was crazier. I made my decision. Ozzy, sir. Ozzy Bean, Chief Charles, my man! William was unhappy. Very well, the captain said. Ozzy Ernesto, you will be our first assistant engineer. William, because I reckon you're a bit smarter than Ozzy, I'm making you chief engineer. William roared laughter, shoving Ozzy so hard they both nearly fell over. Enough roughhousing, Captain Kidd pointed above us to the seat farthest to the left. All along that side of the wall, the chair was bombarded with heavy levers, cranks, and valves. Ozzy up there, his finger drifted right. William, you're next to him. William's chair sat slightly forward, presenting its occupant with countless gauge clusters. Captain Kidd placed a reassuring hand on Don's shoulder. You're next to the wall on the right. Her seat was surrounded by gauges, but instead of the round-faced instruments, hers were square and beset with antique light bulbs and little dials. He looked at me and nodded skyward. Take your position next to our electrotechnical officer. Aye, aye. I climbed the ladder, noticing again our smallest crew member, Joseph, in his travel-sized container, secured snugly to the wall bracket. The little crab was digging through pebbles with strong, pointed legs. 
I pulled myself up into my chair. This was really happening, the liftoff. We were about to take flight in a dynamite-powered rocket. As I settled into my seat, Don smiled anxiously. I returned the smile, mine probably looking no more confident than hers. Don't forget your seatbelt, she whispered. Oh, yeah. I checked the side of my chair, found the belt, and clasped it at my waist. Captain Kidd came up last, pulling himself into the middle seat. When his seatbelt was fastened, he handed each of us instruction manuals for our areas of responsibility. My book was red, leather-bound, entitled in bold text, The Nautilus First Mate, A Working Knowledge of Duties and Operations. On the third page, I found a brief description of what a first mate, a.k.a. the chief officer, did. Apparently, I was to give training to my shipmates, a laughable thought considering my complete ignorance of the vessel. I was also to direct day-to-day -day assignments aboard the ship, ensure the ship's maintenance, safety, and welfare of my friends, the crew. The captain said, Chief, what's the temperature readings on the rocket boosters? I blustered, uh, uh, Let me see. I scanned the multitude of gauges. Their labels were all in thinnest swirling cursive. The writing was elegant, but to an untrained eye it was very difficult to read. I found my answer encased in a miniature window presenting six mercury thermometers. Rocket A is showing 95 degrees in Zone 1, 104 in Zone 2, and 118 in Zone 3. Rocket B temps are similar. What system of measurements are those temperatures? The captain waited. I leaned forward to study the instruments. Difficult to do, lying on my back. I had to prop myself up on my elbows. Finally, I said, Fahrenheit, sir. Are those temps within norms? I have no idea. Uh, zone 3 is in the red, but I don't know if that's good or bad. Captain Kidd leaned toward me, but couldn't see the gauge from his position. Is there a color beyond red? Yes, sir, I said, uh, white. All right, then, tell me if it gets into the white. He drew in a long breath. His hand was resting on a T-shaped handle protruding from the right side of his control module. <sighs> in just a moment, I'm going to twist this handle for all it's worth. His cheeks redden merrily. The dynamo inside this unit will generate an electric shock. He glanced past me to Don. Electricity was her area. That will start a chain reaction explosion in rockets A and B. The dynamite, Ozzy said in awe. That's right, the captain agreed. Remember what I said the rockets are like tuna fish cans filled with dynamite? The explosion starts at the bottom and works its way up. When the can's finished, it falls away, so the ship has less mass the higher we go. That's why the calculations are so hard. William twisted in his seat. When will the center rocket go, the big orange one? The captain shook his head. That's not a rocket. And it's not a fuel cell like on NASA's shuttles. It's a balloon in case of emergency. Don sat forward suddenly. If the shuttle can float, we don't even need rockets. But we do. Captain Kidd tested the grip on the T-handle. The balloon can't carry the shuttle, not by a long shot, but it can carry the five of us if we lose control and have to abandon ship. That's not going to happen. He referred to a scrap of note paper in his pocket, then twisted a pair of tiny cranks on the side of his control module. The cranking action spun numbers on analog odometers. He stopped when the numbers matched the figure on his note. What's that for? I asked. He stuck the paper back in his pocket. That, my good sir, tells us how much explosives we're going to use. 15,780 pounds, to be exact. He winked at me. How are those temperature readings? They were still in the red, but climbing. Is that better? Okay. Huh? Yeah. Huh? That's good. Okay. No.